Good afternoon. I am Harry Poston, co-chairman of the American Statistical Association's Committee for the Filming of Distinguished Statisticians. Today we have as our guest the distinguished expert on censuses and sample surveys, Morris H. Hansen, who has kindly consented to allow us to videotape his responses to questions from a panel of experts in his field. This videotape is sponsored by the Pfizer Corporation and the American Statistical Association and it will be placed in this association's videotape archives. I am pleased to welcome to this discussion our panel members. On my immediate right, Dr. Tura Delanius of Brown University. On my far right, Dr. Samuel Zoll of the University of Connecticut. And next to him, Dr. Barbara Baylor of the United States Bureau of the Census. I am also pleased to welcome our guests Morris Hansen, who in 33 years at the U.S. Bureau of the Census directed the development of modern census methods and was responsible for programs which provided many influential contributions to sample survey methods. He has also continued these contributions in his present position as Senior Vice President of the Westat Research Corporation. To begin our discussion, I will call upon Dr. Baylor. Thank you. Morris, you were one of the team who introduced survey sampling techniques into the census. How were you able to accomplish this, and what did you hope to gain? Well, the, uh, I was one of the team, but the people who were really influential in this were some others. I was a youngster uh, at that point in time, yet had recently joined the Census Bureau. The, uh, some of the most influential ones in persuading this kind of a development were Sam Stauffer from the University of Chicago and Will Ogburn and uh, Fred Stefan and uh, some of the people of more senior people in the Bureau of the Census, Stuart Rice and Cal Didrich. And uh, they had begun dreaming about getting sampling into the census uh, and there was a good deal of resistance to it. The idea was to be able to extend the uh, amount of information that could be collected in a census without increasing the cost that much, without increasing the workload that much. And uh, they uh, were working towards achieving this and uh, then uh, an enumerative check census that uh, came along with to measure the cr under crisis conditions the amount of unemployment in the United States had been a sort of a demonstration project for sampling. That was in 1937. And uh, I think the success of that undertaking, which was widely recognized as a highly successful effort uh, in a, for the post office, uh, rural, I mean, postal office delivery carriers, not just rural. Um, we drew a sample of postal delivery routes and they uh, did a census, in effect, in that sample of postal delivery routes. And the results of this uh, were a major demonstration project. Along the with, with this was the success of the Gallup poll. People were beginning to become conscious of sampling. And uh, so, uh, with the kind of push that was made to get it done, uh, it was accepted by the director of the census with some reluctance, who was a little bit of a conservative at the time and some of the other people in the census. And uh, after it was done, I think there was general and widespread acceptance that this was a method for future development. Morris, your name is associated here with discussion of sampling, survey sampling, sampling theory, but I would like to find the term which also incorporates non-sampling aspects, especially errors. I understand that you have been doing, I know you have been doing quite a lot of work on controlling non-sampling errors. And let me first ask you, can you give some examples of surveys or censuses where there were sizable non-sampling errors which may have dwarfed the sampling errors, which caused some concern to you? Yes, it's uh, easy to give illustrations. Whenever, the, whenever you're taking very large samples, uh, at least if they're well-designed samples, the sampling errors are likely to be small. And the dominating source of error will be a non-sampling error. I think this is probably true 
in national samples that the Census Bureau is doing today for labor force measurement, unemployment and such, and in many other fields where you have large samples. On the other hand, when you are dealing with relatively small samples, or maybe it's a large sample, but you're presenting data for a very small area, relatively small area, or a rel relatively small subset of the population, then the sampling errors get large and may uh, equal and dwarf the non-sampling errors, depending on the size of the sample. Uh, there are some really substantial problems that have arisen sometimes because of non-sampling errors that uh, uh, have uh, dwarfed the sampling errors in a survey. And uh, one of them is uh, in a, uh, when we uh, started taking the labor force survey in 1942 and then changed it over to a uh, different sample, much larger sample of areas in 1954. And we had designed the sample in the first place to what, in a way that we thought would control non-sampling errors. That is a few 68 area primary sampling units with individual supervisors in each area. And the thought was supervisors that close to the work would control it well. Uh, then uh, we shifted to a different system of supervision where we could get higher caliber people, afford to pay higher caliber people, and each supervisor would direct the work of several areas and move the sample up to 230 areas, and uh, then did an overlap of the two surveys. And when the uh, uh, results were available, it became clear that the, uh, the, there was a statistically sig significant and substantial difference in the estimates of unemployment from the old survey and the new. After intensive investigation, the only reasonable conclusion was that the uh, survey work by the original enumerators who were in the old survey areas, who were supposed to be well-trained and we thought could continue performing effectively, were indeed uh, contributing uh, uh, substantial errors in the, their measurements. Apparently, they were losing their jobs and psychological factors and things left them doing a lower caliber job. We concluded that the new people were doing it right, but it gave us an even stronger indication of the need for control of non-sampling errors. And we introduced shortly thereafter a system of uh, various systems of sample inspection and total inspection to identify sources of errors, sample inspection of the field work of the enumerators by re-interviewing and by observing them at work, seeing what they do wrong, both procedures, seeing what they do right, and also by a system of reviewing the returns, which we had uh, been reviewing before, but hadn't been feeding back the errors in an effective way for process control, corrective action. Yeah. And I think that it's under, under far more effective control now than it was, but it's an illustration of a very substantial national problem that occurred with non-sampling errors. You mentioned that when you got the 230 primary sampling units, you could detect that the Measurement errors is larger, far larger. What was the factor? What was the ratio between, say, response variance and sampling variance? Roughly one in three or one in ten? Or do you have a rough idea about it? Oh, I don't believe that I can answer that, but I don't think it was response variance that was causing the problem. It was response bias. Response bias. And uh, in this particular case, the difference I do happen to remember between the old and the new was of the order of magnitude of 20%. Uh, on unemployment. Mm -hmm. On other measures that weren't so sensitive to sampling errors, measuring the unemployed may sound like something that anybody knows uh, whether they're unemployed or not, and we'd all agree on whether they're unemployed or not. Turns out not to be so at all. There are all sorts of marginal cases. We have rather rigorous definitions, try to apply them. The Census Bureau still has. We had then. Uh, they've learned how to do it even better. But uh, there are many marginal cases and possibilities of misunderstanding and communication. Not with the person who's in the labor force, just lost his job, well qualified to work. Uh, there's no problem for some of those. But there are all sorts of cases of uh, people who might not be that well qualified to work or able to work. And, uh, and their amount of effort to, to participation may be simply looking for a job as a babysitting or something like that, but they aren't don't have a job and they want a part-time job babysitting. Those kinds of things you can see are very marginal and it's a difficult area to control, but I think a great deal of progress has been made in it. 
I will take one question which comes to my mind now when you say that, discuss these errors. What was the impact on the uses being made? Were any wrong decisions be made by the administration as a consequence of errors? Indeed. Do you know in a specific case? <laughs> Indeed there were. <laughs> Uh, for example, going back to this same illustration, these are earlier illustrations where there are, uh, uh, where we, before we had as much control as is involved now. But the first illustration I'll give is uh, one where the original design of the labor force survey before it came to the Bureau of the Census involved a non-probability sampling procedure. The, prob the selection procedure was such that the probabilities were not known of selection of people in the sample and there were opportunities for bias. If the relationships between place of residence and work activities had remained the same when the war came on, it wouldn't have had any effect, but those relationships changed drastically uh, as the war came on, migration, all sorts of things. And so a consequence of those non-probability sampling procedures was that in the original survey as designed before it came to the Bureau of the Census, uh, while it was measuring well initially, uh, incurred rather serious biases. And we introduced an area of probability sampling procedure that was uh, capable of producing unbiased estimates from a sampling point of view. The differences were large, and uh, in un especially in agricultural unemployment because the procedure that was uh, causing the bias was a procedure that was applied in rural areas. Well, agricultural employment was a sensitive area during the war. Draft policies were affected by it. There had been uh, uh, postponements of drafting people. Uh, there, they had been not postponing drafting people in uh, rural areas, farm, farm workers. And it turned out that the shortages many people were, cl were claiming were indeed real shortages that the original survey wasn't showing and was contradicting. The new survey said we changed the draft policy, and they did. Thank you. Yeah. On that regard, there's still claim, you keep reading the paper about uh, people uh, claiming that uh, unemployment is uh, greatly underreported, especially in uh, city areas, slum areas. Uh, is, is, that's an unsampling uh, bias. Is that, uh, is that, do you think those are justified? Well, I have a feeling that uh, most of those claims are by people that uh, have a point to prove and are not well based. <laughs> but by saying that, I don't mean that there isn't uh, a little bit of uh, substance that uh, makes them have something of a point. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are uh, weaknesses in coverage. You'd like to, in a sample survey, cover every person that's eligible out there. But both in a census and in the labor force survey, a sample survey, a sample of areas or of households, there are some people who escape coverage, not by design, but in spite of great efforts to get them. Uh, some of those people are young males in particular, there's some others, but young males and especially young black and Hispanic males. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not too anxious to be uh, reporting to the government, maybe. Mm -hmm. And they may bias the results in a small way, but I think the main problem related to what you're saying is uh, if that could be determined by analysis of the results by subclasses uh, of the population and uh, determine the effective validity of, uh, for various uses of the results. Let me ask another question in, different, in a different direction. Uh, there's a lot of concern, which I, th I feel is growing, uh, about the security and confidentiality of information collected by uh, surveys and censuses. And the use of electronic storage only uh, increases this, uh, this uh, apprehension. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, the result of a consequence of that is that people become reluctant to give information, and uh, so that can destroy the usefulness of survey. Uh, do you think it's a major problem, and uh, can you suggest some solutions to this, if, assuming it is a problem? Yeah. Well, first, there is no question there's a lot of concern in uh, various places. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a small but vocal concern. Uh, but it gets in the newspapers, it gets in many places. And, uh, but how much effect it has on the survey results? Uh, I don't think it has a substantial effect on the survey results. The, uh, I should emphasize first that the data that are collected by the Bureau of the Census in particular uh, are protected by law and the Census Bureau vigorously enforces 
uh, that protection. They are uh, they lean over backwards to mm -hmm. be sure that the confidentiality of the data is preserved. Mm -hmm. And uh, some agencies who would like to get access to more detailed information uh, and individual information mm -hmm. uh, are complain bitterly about it. Mm -hmm. But it is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And there is no real substance in that survey of in the case of Census Bureau surveys, no real substance to a concern about that. My own feeling is that there's a great deal of discussion of invasion of privacy. My own feeling is that the data is confidential, that the invasion of privacy impact is, is really relatively small for most mm -hmm. of the kinds of things that to ask people to respond to the mm -hmm. kinds of questions that are basically innocent questions to most people. Yeah. Uh, there's no possibility of it becoming available. On the other hand, organizations like ours have a little different problem. In uh, Westad, we um, collect data and pledge confidenti confidentiality in most of the surveys that we collect data. And uh, in all respects except that legal protection, it operates the same as it does for the Census Bureau. But we don't have that quite that same legal protection. There are those who, under the Freedom of Information Act, have, under certain cases, asked for information. Mm -hmm. Uh, of a confidential nature, and we're currently exposed to that problem right now. We took a survey for the Center for Disease Control on Rice Syndrome. Uh, it's more complicated than I'll say. I'll make it simpler than it is. But uh, the, uh, the survey showed a very substantial relationship, a striking relationship between uh, youngsters who had been treated with aspirin, who had certain kinds of illness and been treated with aspirin, and a control group used for comparison who had not been treated with aspirin. And uh, so uh, the CDC and the advisory committee to the CDC and to Westat said, this is so important to the public health that we need to make it known. Mm -hmm. uh, although this was just from a pilot survey, we weren't quite ready to have it known. But then we, the results were made available. and. Uh, this resulted in a suit by a family of a youngster who had Rice syndrome, had been crippled by it mm -hmm. for, I don't know what the amount is, a million dollars or so. Mm -hmm. If this suit is successful, there will be many other such suits, so mm -hmm. it's an enormous potential expense, and they wanted to get access to the individual data to evaluate our survey. They've sued us for it. It's in the courts right now. Mm -hmm. We're vigorously protecting it to the best of our ability, and uh, the CDC is backing us fully. And uh, my expectation is that they will support us and say that this kind of thing is not subject to the Freedom of Information Act. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll give them all the information we possibly can as long as we give them the information in such a form that uh, it does not reveal individual cases, mm -hmm. protects privacy. W w yeah. what, about, what about the, you know, some of these uh, high school whiz kids who managed to uh, tap into computers? Uh, is that a problem? I guess I'm not qualified to answer that. It's not a problem as far as Westhead is concerned, I don't think. the Census Bureau, you don't know. And I don't think it is for the Census Bureau. We'll have to turn to a better expert. As far as I know, it's not for the Census Bureau either. It's a good question. But it depends on how you're set up on... Uh, yeah. <laughs> In that context, I'd like to take up two cases which are much discussed outside the United States. There's a professor at Harvard in law by name Miller who claims in lectures that Bureau of Census revealed data about American physicians. I think it was about American what? Physicians. Uh -huh. Possibly about <coughs> some economic conditions. We have, when I worked on OMB on related problems, we tried to substantiate the story. We can't find any evidence of this. Do you know anything about that claim? Well, I don't happen to know anything about that particular claim. But this is not unusual, this kind of claim. It's all wrong. It's not true. There are, uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, no case has ever occurred, really, uh, that uh, any data was released in this kind of a form by the Census Bureau. And as I've said before, they're very, uh, very religious about it. Yeah. Now, I, I, I don't say that sometimes some enumerator out there who's pledged to confidentiality and subject to, uh, and subject to penalties might not someday talk with someone about something, but he's well impressed of the dangers of doing it, and the cases just do not come up. They don't appear. It looks as though it's enormously effective. Mm -hmm. 
What about the other case which is quite often used as an argument by right or wrong? This case about the Japanese population in, in the west, on the west coast and the argument has been made that the Census Bureau provided name and address. Is that true? 1940 sometimes. Yes, 1942 I suppose. Yeah. Uh, shortly after we entered the war. Uh, it is true that the Census Bureau statistics were used to find out in what areas the Japanese lived. This is a perfectly legitimate use of census information that does not reveal confidential information or individual identities. Uh, it is totally untrue that uh, individual names and uh, registers were made available for such use, but there is an enorm enormous amount of misinformation around about that. Yeah. I read something in the newspaper, uh, or rather, I guess, something that someone in the Census Bureau sent me that was in the newspaper about how Marines were stationed around the Census Bureau to protect the, uh, this information so it uh, could be used in this way. And this was supposed to be quoted uh, by someone from the White House who talked like they knew what they were doing. Total fabrication, okay. unequivocal. I was there, I went into work every day, nothing like it. Okay. I'm glad to hear. I never saw a Marine out there. <laughs> I Maybe saw some they were disguised. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Morris, I wonder if we could talk a little about the introduction of the UNIVAC into the Census Bureau. You were certainly uh, one of the pioneers in seeing the <coughs> application of large-scale large uh, electronic computers to data processing. How were you able to get that into the Census Bureau? Well, it was a fascinating uh, experience. Uh, relay computers had been in operation for some time <coughs> in various places. And Eckert and Mockley at the uh, Moore School of Electricity got the idea we can do that switching with vacuum tubes and speed it up enormously. And they first built the ENIAC, uh, which was uh, high speed compared to the earlier uh, relay computers. You put information in and took it out by looking at dials and turning switches so it didn't have much use for data processing. You couldn't have any input and output that was effective, but it was used effectively for computing firing tables and things. Mm -hmm. But that was the first large-scale electronic computer. And they got the idea that they could build a computer for data processing that had a high-speed input and output on magnetic tape and higher-speed internal computations. And uh, they carried through the plans for a design, needed financial support, came to the Census Bureau to say they knew that we had been uh, in the vanguard in developing punch card equipment and had large-scale data processing problems and came to ask us if uh, we would give them support. And I remember very well having lunch with them one day and Bill Maddow who introduced them to me. And we were fascinated by the potential. We weren't sure if we could believe it because it was magic almost compared to anything we had uh, conceived of. And uh, we went to the Bureau of Standards to uh, get their reaction from competent electronics engineers. Their reaction was it is indeed feasible. Mm -hmm. And we arranged through them to monitor a contract with Eckert and Mockley to build the computer. There's a long story I can't begin to tell in there, but there were delays used to be something known as a von Neumann constant. I don't suppose many of you have heard of the von Neumann constant. But was, that was the time from today until your computer was going to be delivered. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was a constant over time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, attributed to von Neumann to have made that observation. <laughs> and uh, we were subject to that kind of <laughs> problem for a year or two. But anyhow, in uh, 1951, March 1951, we received the delivery of the first computer. Immediately put it to work. We, of course, had been working with them. Uh, I might say in order to get the computer, um, they had planned mercury tank memories, uh, delay lines, that were mercury tank delay lines to, uh, as memory. I won't try to talk about the details of them something like a drum operating principle, but different. And uh, by the time uh, they were ready to start manufacturing, electrostatic tubes had come out, which were more advanced than the mercury tank memories. Question was, do we want to hold up another 
whatever time it was year and get electrostatic tubes. And we made the decision, no, if we, we know we'll get a antiquated computer, but it'll work for us instead of never having a computer because if you keep trying to get the latest one, you'll never have one. Well, before we got the computer, the electrostatic tubes were also passe. And um, what do you call them, the little? Transistor. Pardon? Transistor. No, not transistors, but um, little, uh, gee, I can't say the name for a minute. Anyhow, little donuts. <laughs> Uh, little tiny ones became a uh, technique of memory, but before long the transistors came in and it keeps advancing and you know what's been happening in each generation of computer. But we did get the computer by making a decision to take one that was uh, out of date. We've never regretted it. Uh, we had recommendations from a committee that Von Neumann was on saying we should not go ahead mm -hmm. because uh, they felt that the advances that were coming were great. I think they were wrong, thought they were wrong then. And uh, everything seemed beautiful and that computer worked pretty much as, as good as we could have hoped for it to be. But uh, we knew at the time we ordered the computer that we had to get an input to it and the way we expected to get the input was to create card to tape punch cards as in the past and then convert cards to tape. And it turned out that while they had built a computer that was remarkably reliable for the day, mm -hmm. uh, the card to tape converters did not operate that reliably and we had quite a lot of trouble yeah. in our first pa usage. Paper tape or magnetic tape? Magnetic tape. Magnetic tape. It, at that time they built a special tape for it or arranged to have contracted for the construction of it special metallic tape instead mm -hmm. of the mylar or whatever. I don't know what's mm -hmm. being used currently. We, it was later changed to mylar. But this, it became a highly successful operation with, in spite of these kinds of difficulties that you get when you're pioneering and was advanced into mm -hmm. other areas and subsequent generators of generations of computers came along and went through to the third generation when I left the Census Bureau and I'm sure you're in the later <laughs> generation now. Did you have any skeptics at the beginning about whether this was going to be useful? We did indeed, some. <laughs> uh, not, uh, not so much at the very beginning, although uh, I remember especially one fellow, and uh, I'll mention him by name because he, uh, he, he, he turned to be a very different kind of a point of view on it pretty soon. A fellow who was chief of the population division named Howard Brunsman. I can't remember what his position was when we contracted for the computer, but I know after we had some of this initial experience and delays in getting the computer and then the problems of making card to tape work so that we could get the output. And uh, basically his philosophy was that when we finish the work on the 1950 census, let's give it to the Indians or something. Don't bring it down here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, there was an overriding, uh, we had demonstrated the effectiveness of it sufficiently that uh, we uh, were able to overcome that kind of opposition and it wasn't too much. And uh, Howard Brunsman got intrigued by it then, shortly after, and became one of the outstanding uh, designers of uh, systems for the computer and was really uh, productive and became worldwide, uh, uh, contributing programs that were used worldwide and very well known. And changed his view <laughs> from a skeptic to an enormous supporter and I an may effective one. And here, something supporting what you're saying, sometimes in the early 1950s he told me once, Ture, don't forget, I'm opposed against the idea of this computer. So, when in the future, just tell everyone, I was against, I realized it doesn't work. <laughs> Five years later, I met him in somewhere, I was I meeting and said, Ture, don't forget, this experiment was successfully carried out on my division. <laughs> You're talking about Howard Brunsman? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, that's correct. <laughs> Did you say that von Neumann was against this project? This von committee Neumann? was. I don't know von Neumann's individual yeah. position. Okay. We had a, com a committee. Von Neumann was a, you all may know, a very yeah. able person. And it wasn't that he was against this development. His name is uh, associated with computer development. Yeah, sure. He made contributions yeah. to design. Yeah. He felt that we were maybe trying to move ahead of the state of the art. I think the later uh, successes in the Census Bureau demonstrated that this committee was wrong and that we were right. Mm -hmm. Commit this all often wrong. <laughs> Indeed they are. <laughs> okay. You wrote what is called the one book, really are two volumes. 
the Old Testament and the New Testament <laughs> the Bible, <laughs> together with Hervis and Maddow. How did you come to write these sizable books, something like 1,000 pages? How did you, wish, well, you were all involved in day-to-day -day operations. How did you come about to undertake this massive job? Mm -hmm. Well, indeed, we were involved in day-to-day -day operations, and I have a feeling I can't really speak from the vantage point of a person in a university because I haven't been there. But I have a feeling it's a different undertaking there than it is when you're working full-time and jobs where the pressures are on you for everything else. The reason we under decided to undertake it is we were, we were really greatly pleased, uh, stimulated by what we'd been able to do and contribute to on the development of sample surveys. The kind of results had been achieved and we thought that we were qualified and able to write such a book and we didn't dream of how much work it was. Mm -hmm. And you imagine. And so we started. <laughs> <laughs> and having started why seven years later and putting in all sorts of nights, Sundays, holidays, uh, for a long, long period, we got the product out. <laughs> the Census Bureau, I might say, gave us all the support they could because we were advancing the welfare of the Census Bureau too. But th and therefore, a lot of the work on it, we couldn't personally spend time in the Census Bureau time on it because we had too many other things to do, but we c were able to take advantage of typographical assistance, secretarial assistance, things like that. And they gave that to us until it was the la in the last stage of uh, typing, and then we had to pay for it outside. Mm -hmm. Do I invade your privacy if I ask you how many copies have been sold <laughs> on these <laughs> volumes? You don't invade my privacy, but I can't give you an accurate number, but it's something between 20 and 25,000 of volume two. And, uh, volume two is the theoretical. I'm sorry, of volume, volume one. one. And volume two is something approaching 20,000. Maybe it is 20,000, I don't know. My congratulations. <laughs> It's still being sold, I might say. Kind of surprising since it was published in 53, and that's uh, a little more than 30 years ago. Well, there aren't that many books around in, on, in the subject, really, so, and it's still useful. <laughs> there are quite a lot of books around yet now. But not, not that comprehensive. Yeah. Several came out. We thought we'd be the first. It turned out that we weren't that fast <laughs> compared to some others. If you would rewrite the book today, suppose you start today with your new now, is there any drastic change you do in the organization? Or you, by and large, organize in two volumes? I think that was a good approach. Yeah. It's been well received. The second volume uh, is the, uh, basically the, pr the theory and the proofs. Yeah. And the first vo vo volumes is b volume is basically the practice, mm -hmm. with a lot of intuitive discussion and applications to particular problems. And I think it's uh, an effective technique of presentation. I don't know how, how others find it, but it seems to have been reasonably successful. It's certainly been well received around the world. Was it used primarily by technicians who had practical problems or as a textbook? Well, I'm sure it's been used as both. I think uh, uh, more by the first. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought of it as both. It uh, gets referred to generally as a reference book rather than a textbook, and but we've taught statistics uh, sampling from it, and others have. But uh, I don't really know the answer. I'm not out there really observing that much on its use. Mm -hmm. I know it's widespread and well received. Do you know if it's been translated to Japanese, Russian, or some of Spanish? That's no, it has not. It has not. There was some discussion of that from time to time, into Spanish and into Russian. Yeah. The Russians told us they thought they were going to do it. They didn't. Yeah. They didn't ask. <laughs> they don't ask for permission. You That's know. right. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, there's an interesting story, not quite uh, like that, but I recently had dinner with Ed Deming and uh, a Japanese that was visiting him, and he had a considerable group of us around the dinner table, and this Japanese turned to me, and I'd never met him before, said, I want to thank you for uh, uh, teaching as my teacher. And uh, said how uh, this book had uh, been a very effective teacher to, met, to quite a number of the Japanese, any of them. And then he said when it was first received after the war, they um, were unable to get copies in multiple copies, and unable to make copies by uh, 
easy methods of reproduction, low cost. Didn't have the, I'm not sure if, uh, if uh, Xeroxine was available quite yet then. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, or if so, they didn't have it. Mm -hmm. He said they uh, copied it in small pieces of film, spread around a lot of that film to people that really wanted it. They read it with, uh, with magnifying glasses. Uh, if a student uh, came to you today and said uh, uh, he'd like to become a survey statistician, uh, could you suggest what sort of fields he should, what topics and courses he should study? And uh, uh, this is someone in his statistics department. Say, uh, uh, what would be a you know? Well, I don't feel that I'm any more expert than others, maybe, yeah. to answer this, but I have my views on it, and I'll make some remarks on it. <laughs> uh, I think that they need to get a good grounding in mathematics and statistics, uh, but they don't need to spend all of their attention in being um, uh, m such good math mathematicians and statisticians that they don't have an opportunity to uh, deal uh, extensively in the applications also. Mm -hmm. And there are many ways you can get into applications. One way is to be participating in surveys and survey design and evaluating them. Another way is to review them on a case study basis, well-designed, particularly large-scale studies, not necessarily large studies. Examine why they were done as they were, uh, why they weren't done in different ways, and often other ways might have been better. Mm -hmm. And uh, look at the whole thing. It's a sample survey design is a problem in systems design, like mm -hmm. other systems design, but it calls on a lot of special talents, a lot of imagination, a lot of innovation to do it. And you need to get the feel for that and get an intuitive feel, as well as ability to solve uh, uh, the mathematical problems, which aren't, aren't to a good mathematician, particularly uh, difficult problems. Mm -hmm. But they're fascinating opportunities. I've always been fascinated by it, and many others I've worked with are, have been and are, I'm sure. Yeah. What about courses outside of statistics departments? Do you think it's worthwhile, or is it better just on-the-job training? Oh, I think some courses outside to get some perspective is desirable also. But one problem I'd like you to comment on, suppose in the Department of Statistics, when I would like to teach survey sampling, it's very difficult to make it realistic in the sense that you can be dealing with all the real life problems, making questionnaires, instructions, sample design and population interviewing and all so on. It's essentially impossible from an economic point of view. That's a different situation from when you're doing, say, consultations on medical data. We have mm -hmm. some medical data you're going to test if a procedure mm -hmm is effective or not. You can take the data and process make the tests as one. Do you have any ideas about one could introduce teaching and survey sampling and get some degree of realism in it in, from the point of view of operations carried out? Well, two ways it seems to me might uh, be successful. One way is to uh, work in connection with a sample survey organization, which may be associated with your university. This is the case, for example, in uh, in Michigan, University of Michigan, Survey Research Center, case in uh, Ames, Iowa, and some others. Uh, and that creates opportunities to do this kind of work. Uh, it could also be done by uh, something that we used to do somewhat, and more could be done of it, I think, of uh, arranging for people to go out for uh, spend a year or six months in a survey organization uh, before they finish their degree, maybe. Uh, if not, why after? But you expect to spend a learning period. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that there's people who, it seems to me, are going to be successful in sample surveys have to not be fascinated just by mathematical solutions of, of uh, problems. They have to be fascinated by solving real problems of the world. Mm -hmm. And if, if you have an interest in that, the opportunities for innovative creation are, are just substantial. And you're not, you need to get a feel for those. It's something you don't just, it's awful hard to teach. Th that would suggest to me that, for, at least for a first course, you don't concentrate too much on the uh, mathematics, but uh, send the students out into the woods or wherever and have them count to the problems of whatever, counting the number of leaves on the trees <laughs> or the number of ducks in their pond or something. Uh, that would, of course, mean that 
you spend your lot of the time with the practical problems uh -huh. rather than the uh, mathematical problems. Yeah, I wouldn't like it to replace the mathematical. Well, somewhere or they have to get. You have to get a balance. You have to yes. sacrifice some for yeah. one for the other some. Yeah. So you think that the computer could be used to, you know, as a kind of substitute. Mm -hmm. Store a population, say several in a computer, at random, select one of these populations, tell the students roughly what it looks like, and say, carry out the survey now to estimate these in that parameter you know, with realistic, pa realistic course parameters and so on. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any, anything about STEAM? Not very much. It sounds to me like it has a lot of potential. If you put in there, you can put real problems in, and yeah. pretty good-sized ones, maybe, if you're mm -hmm. going to do that. Not massive ones, but pretty good-sized ones, yeah. and do that. Uh, and I wouldn't want to uh, say that that goes all the way, but it seems to me like it could, it could have real potential for mm -hmm. uh, evaluating alternatives uh, of the real world. The problem, that the thing you'll miss with that is one of the important aspects of sample survey design is to design procedures that can be carried out as specified. And uh, you might be able to design procedures for sampling from a set of records in a computer that the computer will carry out uh, without error, but they might, that isn't the same as translating them into procedures that you can pass out to a field organization or telephone interviewers or something in such a way that they can carry them through, will indeed carry them through, mm -hmm. uh, as specified. And you never get quite perfection in that, but you have to have it as a strong goal and e exercise sufficient care a good survey design without acceptable execution is uh, mm -hmm. just as useless as a poor survey design. And they, you miss that side of it in this operation, but you could get a lot out of it, I would think. And I haven't really seen that done. I think it's a good... Uh, I know of one case, which I have tried at Brown on a small scale, and to speak of the advantage, it was that you could relate each step to all the rest ones. You selected the sample, you specify your design, you collected your observations, you looked upon the data, did editing, everything in a sequence. And there's the cost function. So we could sort of say, we didn't look upon every single operation in isolation from the rest. But at that time, the computer didn't have storage capability enough to have a mm -hmm. realistic case. We had populations who were samples, I would say, were relatively small. So it was a lack of realism. But anyhow, now the computers are coming, maybe it would be a worthwhile look into that experiment again. Well, it seems to me that this device is not only a tool for training, and it seems to me properly used, it has some real possibilities, although computers with a remarkable capability still, it's difficult to store all of the complexities of a real population in there and, sure. uh, at, and do it without a lot of cost. But the other thing, and we're doing a great deal of this right now, and others are doing it, I don't know uh, how widespread it is, but it's very widespread, is, is uh, in trying to solve sampling problems that are not easily solved by uh, analytical methods, solve them by simulation methods, by putting populations in the computer. Uh, there are many places, as uh, those of you who are working in the field know, where you're using asymptotic approximations, which will hold for large enough samples, but you don't know how good they are for the size samples you're using. And uh, we're doing a great deal of work right now uh, for along this line uh, in connection with uh, rather important work where millions of dollars are at stake in connection with a system of what they call quality control, process control of the welfare programs of the country. One of the things about that kind of computer approach is that you, uh, you miss the human element, uh, the kinds of things that happen to you when you're dealing with real people and real respondents. And I know from my work at the Census Bureau, and certainly I know some of your work at the Census Bureau, some of the most interesting methodological problems have to do with real respondents. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the kinds of work that you did and uh, things that had to do with methodological problems, with respondents, with recall, with those kinds of... Well, yeah, the, uh, you're emphasizing something I, better than what I was trying to say, that you've got to work with the real world and methods that are operationally feasible, but even if they're operationally feasible and you carry them out right, you may not get the right answers or respondents may not understand. Let me just give one illustration. It's one that some of the people in the census staff study they did. I wasn't personally in the middle of the study, but we were involved in it. Uh, 
published in a paper that some of you may know by Waxberg and Eater, which is a uh, interesting application of what you're talking about. One, uh, one of the problems when you go out and ask people questions, you want to know how much income you had last year, how much did you spend last year, or last month, or yesterday, or some other time interval. All sorts of questions, you want to get uh, something, amount of activity associated with time. Mm -hmm. And uh, even people whose uh, desire to cooperate is the best don't have the recall abilities to straighten this out. I have a problem. Someone asked me how long ago did I last have some kind of a treatment for something. I don't know how long ago it was. It might have been a year, it might have been two years. Mm -hmm. My recall <laughs> association with time is very bad. And I'm sure many others are. And uh, so we set up some experiments and ran them in which we did uh, various ways of uh, collecting the information. One was uh, collected by just straight recall, but we did what we called bounded interviewing where we wanted to get information. We did it for various time intervals. And uh, we're talking, uh, this was on housing and uh, home maintenance and repair, this particular survey as I remember it, where the three problem called problems are very great in associating with time. And we found that if you did an interview and then you came in the next time and the person couldn't recall what he had, you can say, well, well, this is the information you gave us last time. He starts to give you something that was done last time. You ask him if that's what it is. We call it a bounded interview, and it is a powerful tool for helping uh, um, getting people to associate information at the right time period. It doesn't guarantee that they will remember everything, but the amount of bias coming from these recalls and what we call telescoping is very substantial in some surveys. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a great major step along the way. Well, that's just one illustration of many that are empirical surveys that, uh, and studies that we carried on and that you're carrying on since that help guide in how to design a census of agriculture questionnaire or a sample survey questionnaire. Talking about teaching sampling, which place should this debate about foundations play in an introductory course in survey sampling? I'm not speaking about an advanced mm -hmm. level, but say introduction, should we be told about the two approaches, model-based, model-dependent, or should, do you think they should leave it out and focus on probability sampling of the hands and herbage meadow sense? Well, I guess if I were doing it, I would do the latter and then bring the, uh, the arguments and the issues in later. I guess that's because I'm persuaded that, uh, but I would use models to evaluate uh, various techniques, models that approximate the real population I have out there, but I wouldn't let the model uh, lead me to and wouldn't teach people to let the model leave me to methods that would be valid only if the model holds. You can pick methods that will be valid even if the model does not hold. Those are what we call probability sampling methods. Yes. But the models can be very powerful in guiding you to very, uh, to more efficient design. At the lot level in the academic career, would you introduce this, con this well, notion, this distinction? I don't feel very confident to really answer that, but my feeling is you ought to get the basics of probability sampling taught first just the sort of the fundamentals, and then you bring these in as more sophisticated developments, but I'm not sure that's the right answer. No one knows. <laughs> <laughs> you don't carry out experiments in this area. You recommend that to others. We're getting close to bringing this discussion to an end, and there's one question that's been in the back of my mind all along in this discussion, and it's the following. Looking back on your career, you have many moments you can probably remember with great pleasure. But if I ask you, what gave you the most satisfaction in your career, what would you say? Well, that's kind of a hard question to answer. Uh, um, gee. I, in one sense, the most satisfaction I got out of it was the working relationship that developed between Bill Hurwitz and myself. And this was a highly effective working relationship, and we would jointly tackle a problem, and we would each contribute to it and be far more effective than uh, either of us could be separately or the two of us combined working separately. Uh, well, that's one kind of way you get satisfaction. I, was, I got an enormous bang out of working with him over the years and on a tremendous, owe him a tremendous debt and a great loss when he died some years ago. Uh, if you'd convert it over to something else, Another area, I would think that uh, what are the really big things that you got that you felt were breakthroughs in methodology? 
I think uh, one of them uh, was uh, the basic original application of area sampling in a successful way to the labor force survey that I mentioned something about earlier. And uh, the results we got and how we were able to demonstrate and persuade that that you could get this and make it work this way and it would measure changes that took place didn't depend on assumptions that uh, there would be stability or something and if the model changed why well, yeah, it doesn't matter you will measure it and your estimates of sampling errors will be good and I think that might be the one big breakthrough thank you um, this is probably a good time to conclude the presentation no excuse me go ahead Tor. Uh, before you conclude the discussion I would like to take this opportunity to mention a little about Morris Hansen's influence outside the United States. As you know, it has been on a uni global basis, but especially it has been great in Sweden. When I started out in this field, I had the privilege of studying in the United States and spent some of my time in bit of a census. And eventually I was able, which was quite a lot of a job, to convince the Swedish authorities that we should bring more Hansen over to Sweden for lecturing. It was so much easier to convince people there to, uh, to should use probability sampling and all, all of these schemes. Thanks to that Morris took the time and came to Stockholm and lectured in a series of lectures on applications for service sampling to Sweden. So I want to thank, take this opportunity myself to, on behalf of my Swedish colleagues to thank you for that you turned the movement around in Sweden at the time where all the bureaucrats thought they knew how to do sampling, take every fifth unit, occasionally every tenth unit, whatever the units are. But we really got the change which was reflected the con convincing arguments you put forward as you remember 1953 in Stockholm. I remember it well, it was a great pleasure. I enjoyed it enormously. Thank you. I, I uh, learned uh, to enjoy a good drink with the Swedes very much. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like an ideal time to conclude our discussion. Before we do, however, I'd like to thank each of our participants, Dr. Samuel Zoll, Dr. Toro Delanias, Dr. Barbara Baylor, and in particular, our guest, Dr. Uh, Morris Hansen. <laughs>